Thomas' important work with mental health in the military, founding the War Horse, and his role in key military-themed discussions shows distinct leadership in his field. He exemplifies how Marines can continue to serve our country and have an impact beyond their time in the Marine Corps. I'm honored to present the Lieutenant General John A. Lejeune recognition for exemplary leadership to the first enlisted Marine ever to receive it, Sergeant Thomas Brennan. Thank you, Major General Lukeman, and to the Board of Directors of the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation for this incredible honor, uh, and to General Berger, uh, Sergeant Major Black, and the other distinguished guests here that are in the audience for joining us tonight. I'd also like to congratulate my fellow recipients for all of your incredible work. Uh, I'd also like to highlight that three of them are War Horse writers, uh, so congratulations to you all. I'd also like to thank my friends and my family who are here with me tonight. Uh, they represent a mix of both worlds that I've lived in. Uh, I have Marines who I serve with in Iraq and Afghanistan. I also have advisors and my team here from the War Horse. I'm also joined by my parents, my in-laws, and my wife and daughter. I love you all. Thank you for never giving up on me. <clears throat> As the first enlisted recipient of the General John A. Lejeune Award, I recognize the significance of this occasion and the responsibility that this award brings. Tonight, we're gathered in a stunning building that is full of stories that were told by journalists and historians who were willing to risk and some who lost their lives to tell the stories of Marines and corpsmen. Men and women who were willing to make sacrifices and face adversity with courage and determination. Two weeks ago, I walked these halls with, with General Lukeman, and I toured the combat artist area that was uh, recently opened. I also stared down on Fallujah for the first time in 20 years. The intricate metal work of the windows caught my eye, and I immediately thought of the Marines that I'd served with. People like Lieutenant Daniel Malcolm, people like Lance Corporal Bradley Faircloth, and as I looked at those windows, I instantly imagined shouldering my small rocket again. <clears throat> Before Phantom Freery began in 2004, I stood with my team leader, Corporal Mike Ergo, and one of my best friends, Lance Corporal Daniel Jane, both here tonight. Together, we listened to our battalion commander tell us to expect heavy casualties, and then we listened to Sergeant Major Carlton Kent give his famous whoop butt speech. <laughs> Days later, as we pushed house to house, we were shocked when Sergeant Major Kent joined us on patrol and we all worried we'd get the incoming Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps killed. But what Corporal Ergo and Sergeant Major Kent did unknowingly was they cemented in our minds that good leaders are willing to take point on the most dangerous missions. In 2010, their lessons proved priceless as I was deployed to Helmand Province where I led a squad of Marines. For some reason, my Lieutenant, Chris Alderman, decided me to allow me to lead my ragtag band of misfits. Earning their trust has been the greatest honor of my life. I loved leading Marines, and I love my squad. My favorite memory is us eating dinner in Afghanistan. We were huddled around a campfire, and it broke all the rules. I got to be TJ, Jim got, Roche got to be Jim, Moon got to be Dustin, Chun was John, and Huber was the guy who would do anything for $20. We talked about life back home, and we ate Kunjak chicken. And together, we, we escaped our reality for a few moments a day. And like Jim would say every time he dug up an IED, it was a real treat. But when, the four of us, when four of us were wounded, I lost my sense of purpose. And when members of my chain of command turned their back on me, my love for the Marine Corps started to fade. Thankfully, my mental health team and my family helped me find my way home. And while it may have been my therapist, Frank, who handed me a notebook, and Doc Smullen, who told me to keep writing, it was a bougie, award-winning journalist from Reuters who inspired my passion for public service journalism. Tonight, Finbar O'Reilly is somewhere in Ukraine, probably on a foot patrol or strapped to the side of a tank. 
And like my squad in Afghanistan, the troops by his side are lucky to have him there. As my team and I have grown the warhorse, the core and what I learned in uniform has never left my side. Having walked on both sides of the fence as a Marine and now as a reporter, I learned that journalists, Marines, and our families have more in common than most of us realize. Together, we're largely understood by the communities we serve. And while it may be in different ways, we all play a vital role in our democracy. Over the years, journalism has allowed me to share the stories of Marines. Ones like Max Kribelar, who served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and who was the first Marine to tell me that coming home from combat takes, showing, takes patience and showing yourself some grace. I've also chronicled the stories of Montford Pointers and POWs, Vietnam veterans who were poisoned by Agent Orange, and I'm grateful to say that our team has earned the trust of leaders in DOD and VA, as well as trailblazers like Corporal Maria Daume, who was the first enlisted infantrywoman. But the warhorses also use sunlight as a disinfectant, and I'm proud to have done so. Whether these investigations have explored sexual violence or failures in the Marine Corps' criminal justice system, I am drawn to giving voice to the individual Marine. And I keep in mind the standard that was set by General Lejeune. The relation between officers and enlisted should in no sense be that of superior and inferior, nor that of master and servant but rather that of teacher and scholar, he wrote in 1920. Be kindly and just in your dealings with your enlisted Marines. Never play favorites. Make them feel as though justice tempered with mercy may always be counted on. As an enlisted Marine, I witnessed that Marines are capable of the best and worst leadership traits. Demanding answers for the latter does not negate the former. I've never considered speaking up about mental health, founding the war horse, or any of my reporting as bold leadership. And as I've prepared for today, I've reflected on my body of work. What I hope that others see when they look at me is a career in public service that started as a Marine recruit, and that reporting is another way that I still get to protect Marines. The Marine Corps taught me to challenge the status quo, to know myself and seek self-improvement. And the Warhorse team has helped to make measurable, positive differences in our Marine Corps and the military more broadly. And I hope, more than anything, my work demonstrates that it's possible to love the Marine Corps and to want its leaders to do better for its Marines and their families. I ask leaders tough questions because I understand the stakes. I've laced up my boots and I've kicked in the doors. I've been willing to lay down my life for some leaders and I've reluctantly followed others. I've lost Marines to bad luck and to bad decisions. And like too many Marines, I've witnessed the impacts of the justice system on unit cohesion and decades later have watched them fight to piece together their lives because of it. I have lived and contributed to the good, the bad, and the ugly within our ranks. And like the Marine Corps and some of its leaders, I have grown and improved with time. <clears throat> but there's still work to be done. Like many of the service members and families that we report on the War Horse, we believe that there are tangible solutions to our country's biggest problems <clears throat> and that we can help veterans and military families be better understood by the communities that they serve. And we can help keep our Corps honor clean. In closing, I would like to read a quote from General Lejeune's first letter as Commandant dated 100 years ago and edited to reflect the contributions of women Marines. It applies not only to the Marine Corps, but to the journalism industry and our society more broadly. You should never forget the power of example. The young men and women serving as enlisted Marines take their cue from you. If you conduct yourselves at all times as officers should conduct themselves, the moral tone of the whole Marine Corps will be raised. Its reputation, which is most precious to us all, will be enhanced and the esteem and affection in which the Corps is held by the American people will be increased. Thank you all for your time, and thank you again for this truly incredible honor. I believe that I've represented enlisted Marines and our Marine Corps well. Semper Fidelis.
Thank you, Thomas, for accepting this award and for continuing your service to our nation.